Hello, everybody. We're going to look at European culture during the Baroque era. And so the focus question for this section is, what were some of the ways European culture responded to the changes in the 17th century? So how does, how does the, you know, maybe not the average European, but what is what can we see that happened to art and culture because of this crisis, you know, because of absolutism, because of the inflation of the early uh, 1650s and 1700? How do people deal with this? And religious change, really importantly. So this is the city of Rome. Rome, as you hopefully know, is the center of the um, you know, Roman Catholic Church. This is the center of the center of the Roman Catholic Church, St. Peter's Basilica. And so this is actually the second basilica on the site. And it's designed in a way that basically takes the idea of the Renaissance, which is supposed to be the return to the power and the values of the Roman Empire and says, you know what we're going to do? Protestantism has this right. They care about things. So we're not just going to copy. We're going to make, you know, what we believe are classical Roman Catholic values, Roman Catholic spirituality, as good as the Protestant Reformation is, as authentic. And we're going to improve on the old. So it's a really interesting time period as far as all of that goes. You know, it's not just, you know, wars and revolutions, wars of religion. It's also changing the way that people see the world. So this is some of, an example of the Catholic art of the, um, you know, the basis of this crisis of the 17th century. And this is a work by a famous artist, El Greco. He is in a lot of ways showing the anxiety of the Catholic world about being left behind by the Protestant Reformation. Um, is Rome going to continue to be the center of the universe as it defines itself? And so they take the style in what um, mannerism, which is basically what El Greco is doing, eventually involves in what's called Baroque, which is kind of what we're looking at in the last image with St. Peter's Basilica. You know, again, improving on the old while not abandoning those values. Various cities throughout Europe that were controlled by the Habsburg dynasty, which is, again, if you remember from the last presentation, the last section, the dynasty that ruled Austria and Spain um, become, you know, built up in this new style. As the population also grows, if you remember from the introduction of food crops in the Americas, like the potato. So potatoes and this art actually have something to do to get with each other, which is an insane thing. All right. This is uh, William Shakespeare, or as his friends called him, Billy Shakes. Um, and he is effectively an employee of the royal government of England, which is trying to justify itself in a sense. So... Under the Puritans, under Oliver Cromwell, plays are banned, dancing's banned. It's, you know, I think I made the joke, it's like footloose. William Shakespeare is part of a generation that grew up under Protestant monarchs who aren't Puritans, but aren't also aren't Catholic. So they have to tread this line where they have to say, we are on the right side of history, and paying an artist to make a play that doesn't criticize you is considered to be a way of showing that your monarchy is valuable. Um, Similar pattern happened in Spain, where uh, Lope de Vega writes plays that are basically not about religion or the monarchy. And as much as it's not a direct connection to, you know, upholding the power of the king of Spain, for example, it makes the Spanish monarchy look good to other countries to have this art coming out of it. And it makes the, the monarchs popular with the people, that they have an outlet that they can kind of understand the world through. It's a very, and, you know, people want to find some place to go when they're under stress. And so they go to the theater in this time, because this is the, you know, the new thing that's allowed to be done. Uh, Don Quixote, which is, it's honestly a beautiful story. It's one of those things that you're not going to be assigned to read in high school, probably, but I would highly, highly recommend you go off and find a copy of it in college. There's different translations. You know, maybe you get a one that's harder to read. It's originally written in Spanish. But it's a it's a story of you know hope in a lot of ways, which is useful, um, and working hard to get those dreams realized. So that work is still considered one of the greatest works in history, just like the works of Shakespeare. Um, in political thought, you've learned you know through U.S. history and U.S. history too about basically the Enlightenment philosophers' influence on the U.S. Constitution, Declaration of Independence. Uh, just to kind of refresh you, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke are two English philosophers that kind of sum up the basic debate about the nature of humanity. Hobbes argues that life is nasty, brutish, and short, 
We need government to crush the evil instincts that lie within us. Um, and that's the deal. There's a deal between government and the governed that the government will protect you, which should hopefully sound familiar. Uh, John Locke says the government is necessary only as much as it protects your rights. Beyond that, we don't need it. And so, you know, you have these two kind of almost contradictory ideas that both have rings of truth that we try to include in the way that the U.S. Constitution was structured. And as you'll see in the next unit, the French Revolution tries to achieve. So watch this space, as they say. And that's that. So congratulations. You've just finished your first unit of world history, at least as far as lectures go.